Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Father, I this morning simply want to pray the words of Moses, your servant. I pray, Lord, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. I ascribe greatness to our God. Holy Spirit, drop like rain now on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your finger in Isaiah 55 and turn over to Matthew 22. Many of you know Isaiah 55 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I love what the Lord tells us about His Word. But in going back over it again, I wasn't even sure if I would preach on this or teach on this one section other than uh, to go through it on a Wednesday night because we, we refer to it so often. And yet going back through it this past week, I'm reminded once again of something that is so amazing and so astounding in the way God has chosen to communicate with His people. And I want to look at that today. But I want to begin with the parable of Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 1. Where Jesus tells a story about the kingdom, he says in verse 2, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. So he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. And went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few chosen. Now that parable is so packed full of meaning that if you want to understand it fully, I encourage you to spend some time studying it. Go back. We actually have a teaching on that in Matthew on the website. And you can go and listen through and think through these things because there is so much here. But this morning, I just want you to know one thing out of the parable Jesus told. Notice the order of the invitations. Everything is set. Everything's ready. The feast is prepared. The marriage happening. The son ready for the bride. It's all good. And the first invitation goes out. 
the first invitation. But the invitees were disinclined to acquiesce to the request. In other words, they said no. So the king sends out a second invitation. And this scandalous parable of Jesus is a true picture of people's response to God. Of how he sends out the invitation and it's rejected. And how he also sends out the invitation to those you would not expect to receive it. And they do receive it. It's a picture of God's invitation to salvation. It's a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ going out into the world. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now think about this. Last week we were in Isaiah 53. We looked at the song of the suffering servant, which truly is the pinnacle of the gospel in the Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah 53 describing the death of Jesus, describing the burial of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus in such specific terminology as we talked about. It's just astounding. Isaiah writing these things 700 years before they happened on earth. The prophecy blows us away. But it is a prophecy that is the gospel, the gospel portrayed, the gospel invitation. How does God follow that message in Isaiah 53? Well, immediately he brings us Isaiah 54, which I think is perfect. Because of the content. You see, Isaiah 54 is an invitation to the Jewish people. In fact, it's an exclusive invitation. It's a summons to the Jew first. It is an invite. Go through Isaiah 54. It is an invite to a glorious homecoming, a wedding feast, or better yet, it's a renewal of vows that the Lord invites His own people to come to an exclusive invitation. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 6. He says, the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she's rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you. And so Isaiah 54, the whole chapter, is a personal, exclusive invitation limited to Israel. Given first to the Jewish people, Isaiah 53, the sacrifice, Isaiah 54, the invitation goes out to Israel. But Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, and also to the Greek or the Gentile, which means that once the exclusive invitation goes out and is rejected, then there should be another invitation that goes out. Gang, Isaiah 55 is that invitation. Isaiah 55 is an all-inclusive invitation. Not exclusive, but inclusive. Verse 1 of Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance or literally fatness. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. (laughs) The word everyone at the beginning of Isaiah 55 is kol in the Hebrew. Kol. It means all. It means the whole. Isaiah 55. Listen, Isaiah 55 is a universal invitation With a personal limitation. Wait, I thought you said it was all inclusive. It is. But that doesn't mean all will accept it. The invitation goes out. But not everyone will accept it. That's the point, I believe, in the parable of Jesus about the man who's there, but he doesn't have wedding clothes on. He's there, but he's unprepared. He shows up, but he's not showing up the way he was invited to show up. If you know anything about Jewish culture, you know that wedding clothes were often provided if someone didn't have them. And you showed up at the wedding, the appropriate attire would be on a rack somewhere. They'd say, oh, well, let let us provide this. Clearly, the man in the parable didn't want to dress right. Didn't come the way he was called. He showed up, but there's an air of rebellion. And so the king says, out of here. You're gone. You, You either come my way or you don't come at all. In the marriage parable... Uh, We hear about the exclusive invitation going out to the wedding guests. They reject it. Then we hear about the inclusive invitation that goes out to everybody. And yet someone still is rejecting in their heart. 
So the invitation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is absolutely universal, has been ever since it was spoken from the beginning of time to the end of time, a universal invitation with a personal limitation. Now, I need to be theologically clear about a couple of things before we go any further. And I want you to understand, just from my perspective, and you may disagree with me, and that's okay. You're always allowed to be wrong, and I still love you. (laughs) I reject, on biblical grounds, the notion of universal salvation. There is universal invitation. We've talked quite a bit about this on Wednesday nights especially. There is not universal salvation. In other words, everyone will be saved. All rivers lead to the same sea, and somehow, even if you don't know or believe in Jesus, before you die, afterward, you'll be fine. Well, then you'll be dining eternally with Hitler. Universal salvation? And there are those who teach it. And you know what? I get it. I truly do. The idea that anyone would be condemned is a difficult thought for us, especially if you have an ounce of compassion. You don't want to see that happen. And so there are those who who say, well, then somehow... Somehow, mystically and wonderfully and supernaturally, God's just going to save everyone. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I think he's going to do it. And yet Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, but there are few who find it. Right there it indicates not everybody is going to enter the narrow gate. Not my words, Jesus' words. And by the way, Jesus' words are a whole lot better than my words. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Which should shake us up a little bit, because that's the language of religious people. He says, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice Lawlessness. He quotes from Psalm 6, verse 8 right there. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The key, Jesus says, is, I never knew you. Enter through the narrow gate. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the gate. I'm it. The gate is narrow. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I'm the gate. One way. One narrow way. Well, that's not fair. Hey, there's one bridge that gets you to Whidbey Island. How many of you stand at the edge of the bridge week after week with protest signs saying, Not fair! One way! No fair! (laughs) Shut up! Get in your bridge and get in your car and drive across the bridge! For crying out loud. One way. And of course the question is asked, Well, how could God... Remember, that's not a good question. How could God send people to hell? Does God just stop loving them the moment they die? Here's something for your theological mind-blowing. God never stops loving people. It's not that He stops loving. Oh, you didn't make it. You're out. No. The reality is that God's heart will break for the lost for all eternity. Because God is love. He never stops loving. God's love is universal. God's love is eternal. But His nature is eternal. Perfect. And because of his perfect nature, salvation is limited to those who are pure enough to come into his presence. Those who have all the lights on. (laughs) Those whose lives are perfect and shining and glorified. And that's impossible for all of us. Which is why Jesus went to the cross. It's why he died. That's the whole point. He died that we might... Be purified. He died that we might be sanctified. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, what nobody can do for themselves. We will be counted out if not for the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, if not for what Jesus did. So I reject on biblical grounds the notion of universal salvation. There is universal invitation through Jesus, but salvation is limited to coming to God through Jesus. I also, secondly, reject, on the other hand, the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement. Some of you may be uh, Calvinists. I think it's kind of funny. I hear there are five-point Calvinists, and then there's everything else. There are four-point Calvinists. I'm a two-point Calvinist. Well, I'm a one-point Calvinist. (laughs) Great. That's wonderful. Here's one point I absolutely disagree with. Limited atonement, which teaches in Calvinism that only the elect 
That is, only those who are predetermined by God can be saved. Those that God said ahead of time, I'll save him, I'll save her, I'm going to save him, he's all right, she's good, he's out, she's gone, bye bye Limited atonement. For one thing, one of the reasons I reject that is even the use of the word atonement. The use of the word atonement is passe, gang. Atonement is a Hebrew concept. Atonement is covering. The sin's still there, it's just covered. It's just covered over. I like the word propitiation a whole lot better. Now, it's a weird word sounding wise, but it's a better word. Jesus himself is the propitiation for our sins. You all know, Bible students, the total cleansing of our sin. It's not that my sin is covered. It's that my sin is gone. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours only, but John writes, listen, also for those of the whole world. That's not limited atonement. That's not even limited propitiation. Jesus died to wash away the sins of the whole world, which means if the whole world came to faith in Jesus, there would be enough cleansing for everybody. But there's still a limitation here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world and whoever believes The gospel is unquestionably universal. The only limitation to this great invitation is something we celebrated last week, something Don just talked about, and that is freedom. I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but our freedom can be our single limitation to salvation. Don't misunderstand me. I love my freedom. I thank God for my freedom. And I thank those in our military who have fought for and died for and suffered for our freedom as Americans. But gang, it's because of freedom that some will not be saved. Because I am free to choose. I am also free to reject God's invitation. It's not going to force it. We don't read in the parable that the servants go out and they grab the guests and drag them kicking and screaming into the feast. No one is dragged into heaven. You have to choose. The choice is yours. And so there is a limitation there. So with that understood, the first half of Isaiah 55 is the universal invitation. And it's a marvelous chapter. We looked at it a week ago Wednesday. But the second half, which concerns us this morning, describes the delivery process. How does the invitation get out? How is that all-encompassing, all-inclusive, universal invitation. How does it get to the world? Let's pick it up in verse 6. Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I was asked the other day, What exactly is righteousness? And by the way, there is never a foolish question. There's never a stupid question when you're coming to the Lord with an honest heart. And I've had many people over the years say, what exactly is righteousness? I mean, you think it'd be obvious, but it's not necessarily. What does righteousness mean? Gang, to be righteous is very simply to be right with God. Righteousness is just, I'm right with God. Our relationship is good. It is unbarred. It is unfettered. We are, we are together. We're good. Right with God in mind and in spirit. Wickedness is a behavioral problem. Wickedness is acting out. You don't say someone is wicked because you know what's on their mind. You say someone's wicked because you see what they do. Or you hear what they say. It's, it's overt. Unrighteousness, on the other hand, is covert. Unrighteousness is a heart and a soul problem. Unrighteousness describes a person's inner life, and the inner life always affects the outer life for good or for bad. But the battle for righteous ways, gang, is fought in the field of the mind. It's fought in the field of the mind. That's why he says, let the wicked forsake his way, the wicked person, his behavior, but the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Because that's where unrighteousness happens. That's where a person is not right with God. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's not just his behavior, your behavior that he's after. It's your thoughts. 
He wants to be right there because if we're right here in the thought and in the spirit, we're going to be right in our behavior. It's why the Lord keeps raising the question of what we put into our minds. It really does affect us. I've shared it here many times. I've talked with my boys many times about, and my girls, about this idea of the white dog and the black dog. The white dog and the black dog. Whichever of the two dogs you feed the most is the one that's going to win. If you have two voracious dogs who fight in battle, you feed both dogs. If you're feeding, let's say the black dog's the good dog, just to mess with you. <laughs> you're feeding the black dog, that sweet black lab, you're feeding him, he's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The white dog over here, that scroungy mutt, you're not feeding him. Guess who's going to win in the fight? Same thing in our thought life. If we feed the Spirit, if we nurture our minds with good things, Paul writes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think about these things. Because the more you think about those things, guess what? The more righteousness is developed in your mind, in your thought life, the more every thought is captured by Jesus. But if you focus on the evil things and the dark things and the wicked things and the ugly things and the impure things and the mean things, and I could go on, guess where you're going to go? Guess what is going to have sway over your life? And so we're told, let the wicked forsake his way, let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. But even when the mind and the spirit are right, there's an immeasurable difference between our thoughts and God's thoughts. For the most spiritual, godly person on the face of the earth, the distance between that person, the Billy Grahams of the world, the distance between him and God is so vast, it is so immense. Isaiah 55, verse 8, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Let's get this one thing straight. You don't think like I do, God says. You don't act like I do. You don't get it. The distance between verse 7 and verse 8 is absolutely huge. The distance between the one seeking the Lord and the Lord himself. Gang, I call it the great divide. The great divide. I'll give you three things to jot down as we look at this this morning. And the first is the great divide. God gives us this amazing, vast contrast. This distance between man and God. It is incalculable. In verse 9 he says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let me ask you this question. How high are the heavens? Anyone got a yardstick? (laughs) How high are the heavens, truly? I I encourage you sometime, Google what's beyond the universe. Just Google that question and see what comes back. You will get tons and tons of sights from physicists and astronomers and psychics and astrologers. (laughs) From all manner of people trying to describe or explain or talk about how vast the true universe is. And every time we think we've reached the edge of the universe or how far we think it is, we realize it's bigger. In fact, scientists do know this much. The universe continues to be expanding. Every time we think we've figured out how far, it's, it's further. It's bigger than we even know. Why is this? Why can't we truly define the edge of the universe why can't we truly say how high are the heavens because unless you've been there you don't know only god knows only god's been there i don't believe any of us we can't even turn that light on and i know it's bugging me today (laughs) we can't even imagine how high are the heavens and god says i want you to think about that because that's how far that's how distant my thoughts are from yours huge he said to Job in Job 38, 33, Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Or do you fix their rule over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens? Do you get how I do what I do, God says to Job? Do you even know what's on my mind? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. They are farther than the heights of the heavens. That's a humbling reality. 
It's a good humbling reality, you know. For those who, who claim to follow Jesus and, and love God and, and give their lives to Him to remember, we ain't God. We're no better than anybody else. We're just people who happen to have found that one narrow way. And we love Him. Amen. Earthly man, however, has no heavenly idea. We just don't. How can our finite minds grasp His infinite will? But here's a conundrum. Here's a problem. On the one hand, His thoughts are so vast, so distant from ours, we can't even comprehend. And yet Paul writes in Romans 12, too, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, if His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, how can I know His will? How is that even possible? And then Paul prays this prayer. <laughs> Ephesians 3.17 Being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Wow! Wow! Paul, you're praying something that as I read Isaiah 55, I'm not sure that's possible, is it? To be filled up to the fullness of God? If His thoughts, if His ways are so far beyond us, how can we know His will? Great question. Read on, verse 10. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Number two, the grand delivery. The grand delivery. You see, we have this issue, this problem, the great divide. And so God devised the grand delivery. You know, before we got to the sunshine of the last couple of days, which has been glorious and wonderful and beautiful, we've had some serious rain. Those of you who live here in western Washington, which is most of us, you know we don't really get rain here. The world doesn't understand that. We get mist. We get gray. We get wet somehow. We don't know why. We walk outside and it's like, it's just it's because it's just the moisture in the air, you know. Boy, Monday and Tuesday, John and I were driving back home Monday night. The rain was pounding. It was awesome. I love when it does that. You know, Tuesday morning as I was studying, the rain was just coming down in sheets. It was pouring down. It was heavy on the earth. And I was so happy because Tuesday preceded Wednesday, the 4th of July, and everything was going to be nice and wet just in time for, boom, <laughs> fireworks. So Monday night it poured, Tuesday it poured. God chooses and uses a potent picture in Isaiah 55 of how he delivered his message, how he gets the invitation across the great divide. What he does is he uses the picture of what we call the water cycle of planet Earth. He describes the water cycle. It's interesting, 600 years after Isaiah, in the first century, Marcus Vitruvius wrote down a philosophical theory of what was called the hydrologic cycle. It's a theory that somehow he wrote that the waters from the heavens fall to the mountains and infiltrate the earth's surface, causing the streams and developing springs in the lowlands. Later on after that, Da Vinci, among others, scientifically verified the hydrologic cycle and the water table in the earth. But it wasn't even until the 17th century that hydrologic variables began to be quantified. What does that mean? It means we took a long time figuring out what Isaiah already said, what God pronounced about his word using a picture of the water cycle of earth. The spirit-inspired prophet describes the water cycle beautifully, and like that rain, God decisively says, my word comes down, my word goes up. It does not come back to me empty. I pour it out like the rain. It becomes like streams and rivers. It fills and saturates the ground, bringing up the water table, bringing about the dew on the land in the mornings. And it comes back to me, evaporating, coming back up. And I send it down again. And there's this cycle of the Word of God coming to people on the earth that we might understand the invitation. He spans this vast distance, this great divide, with a grand delivery. 
My word does not come back to me empty. But gang, this is not only talking about generic eternal salvation. It's more immediately personal. And this is what I want you to really understand this morning. Look, look at what his word does. Number one, it waters the earth, causing it to bear and sprout. It waters the earth, causing it to bear and sprout. Keep your finger there and go over to the book of James. James chapter 1. It's right after Hebrews. Just before Peter. I don't know if Peter had a problem with that or not. We don't know that. (laughs) James chapter 1. I thought it interesting that Don chose to read from this very passage this morning. He didn't know what I was talking about. I, I sit here and when that kind of thing happens at communion, I just go, thank you, Lord for confirming your word to us today. James chapter 1, verse 21. James is the brother of Jesus, but chose to call himself simply a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus. James writes, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. I want you to notice something here. He doesn't say that the word is able to save your spirits, although it does. But he very specifically chooses the Greek word suke, souls. It's where we get our word psyche. Okay, it's it's talking about the mentality, our, our our thoughts. He doesn't say the word saves the spirit. That's the Greek word pneuma. He says faith in God's grace. You know that does that. But James says the word implanted is able to save the soul. The suke, the mind, the intellect, the will. Remember what Isaiah said? Or God said, our thoughts. Which affect our ways. Are saved by the word. You understand this? As the rain and snow. He, his word waters the earth, causing it to bear and sprout. What does this mean? It means if our minds get in sync with God's word... Our minds, our thoughts become healthy and fruitful. We begin to do. Not because we figured it out, but because we're in tune with God, we begin to do the things that are good and right and joyful and free and happy and blessed. We just think that way. But look at verse 22. James says, but prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. If anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. What is James talking about? Same thing God is talking about through Isaiah, gang, and it is the transformative power of the Word of God in a person's life. Yes, by hearing the Word, you can come to faith in His grace and you can be saved. But it's bigger than that. It's more immediately practical for you and me. It's why after we find salvation in Jesus, we continue in His Word because there is an immediate effect. If you accept it, God's Word will affect supernatural changes in your suke, in your soul. You will be supernaturally altered as the Word of God seeps in. Impacting your life for eternity, but also impacting your life for right now. The more we're in the, the less we're in the Word, the less the impact. If we're not in the Word at all, no impact. I keep having these conversations with people going to churches that are not teaching the Word. It breaks my heart. It's like full-grown adults waking up and for breakfast having a cracker. And then maybe at lunch having a sip of water. And wondering, why am I not more godly? Why am I not more fruitful? Why am I, why am I just always hungry? The Word. The Word gets in and impacts our lives. Listen to what Paul says. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He said, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted not the Word of men, but what it really is. What's that, Paul? The Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. No other book does that, gang. There's no other word you can read that gets in and begins to perform a work in you. 
But God's Word waters the earth. God's Word causes it to bear and to sprout. His Word makes stuff happen. It's dynamic. It's efficacious. It is immediate in your life. And so allow the Word to sink in, to germinate, and it will cause to bear and to sprout. It's a powerful thing. It is a transformative thing. And it's why God continually in His Word encourages us to be in His Word. So it causes to bear and sprout. His Word also furnishes seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And by the way, therein lies our freedom. It's seed to the one who sows. It's bread to the one who eats. It's only seed and bread for those who choose to sow and to eat. If you choose not to sow, you don't have to sow. You don't want to eat, you don't have to eat. But you have to both sow and to eat if you want to get any good out of the Word. Sowing the Word, teaching the Word. We're, but did you all know that we're called to be teachers, every one of us? That teaching is not limited to Pastor Rick? We are all, as followers of Jesus, called to be able to teach His Word. <laughs> Don't ask me to do that. Why not? It's the most real and tangible and life-altering thing in our lives. Can you talk about that? I, it's... I won't tell you it's easy for me. You won't pay me anymore. But it's, it's easy to walk in the Word and to share the Word if it's in you. It's easy to sow if you have the seed. If you don't have the seed, it's not very easy to sow, right? If you don't have the bread, it's difficult to eat. Isaiah said back in verse 2, listen to this again, Isaiah 55, Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But we still have a problem. If his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways, how on earth can our minds get in sync with his? And it's something else he says here, the word like rain. Listen. The word like rain comes down from heaven and returns there. Well, how does that work? It works because the word is more than written or spoken. Big debates. We've talked about the debate in the church between the written word and the spoken word. Well, is it the written word of God or is it the spoken word of the Holy Spirit in your life? And, and there are those who would say the spoken word of God, the Holy Spirit speaking to you is more valuable. And those say, no, no, no. It's the word of God that's more valuable. And I think it's, it's a ridiculous debate because it's all the word of God. But what I want is even more than the written word, even more than the spoken word. There are those who just say, I want to hear God speak. You know what I want more than that? I want to be with Jesus, who is the word of God. He's the word. He's the logos. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. The word is written. Yes, the word is spoken. Absolutely. But the word is a person. And I had never seen this before. But note exactly what he says. My rain, my, his word goes down to the earth and it returns to him. Jesus, who came down to the earth, returns to the Father. Just like that water cycle of the earth, rain and snow coming down, swelling the streams and the rivers, filling the lakes and the seas, establishing and maintaining the water table. So Jesus, the living word of God, came down to make us bear and sprout before returning to heaven. Leaving in us the water table of his spirit. That we might bear and sprout. First Timothy 3.16 without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. You could say great is the mystery of the great divide. The whole idea that we down here can be godly when he is so far up there. Great is this mystery, Paul says. God was manifest or seen in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. But listen to this. Here's the result of His coming down. Ephesians 4, verse 7, To each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also Himself descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is also him who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The word comes down from heaven and returns to heaven. And the word, my friends, is Jesus. 
the grand delivery of Isaiah 55 is more than just an invitation. It's even more than simply the determination of God to get this invitation into people's hands. With the delivery of Jesus into your life, what happens is the power to be changed comes upon us. The power to be conformed into the image of Christ by the compelling word of God. Jesus himself is the bridge. Jesus himself bridged, as we sang earlier, the great divide. He bridged the gap. It's him. He makes possible the impossible. He connects our thoughts and our ways to conform with God's. We could not do that. He does it. Romans 8.29, this is why Paul said the following, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And God says, these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Wait a minute. The Calvinist among us says, I have an objection. You said earlier that you don't believe in this Calvinist doctrine. And right there, Paul just said, predestined. What do you do with that, Pastor? (laughs) Well, I planned ahead for that question. (laughs) You know, this passage, and you might note it in your Bibles, Romans 8, 29, and 30, would be a great Calvinist passage. If it began with the statement, he predestined, but it doesn't. It begins with the statement, those whom he foreknew he predestined. What are you talking about? Totally different thing. If God, God knew the free choice of every single believer, he knew the free choice that every single believer would make, and knowing that you would make that free choice predestined you to be Christ like. That's what he says. He doesn't say that he predestined you to be saved beyond your choice, beyond your decision. You're either saved or you're not. You're either going to hell or you're going to heaven and you have no say in the matter. No. He knew who would choose. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now listen, because this is amazing. You believers in Jesus, what that means is, he looked ahead and he said, you know, I know Steve is going to choose me. So what I'm going to do for Steve, because I, before he even made the choice, I knew he would. God's God. He knows. I knew Steve would make that choice before he made it. I am going to predestine him to Christ's likeness. I'm going to do something for him that he can't do for himself. I'm going to predestine him to be like my son because he chose me. Wow. Now that's, that's some good, good doctrine right there. Predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. He looks ahead. He says, I know you're going to choose me, so I, in return, predestine your conformity to Christ. Why? Why why does God do that? Now, Now think about this for a second. Have you ever made a major life decision and then wavered on it after the fact? Home buyer's remorse. We've been in our house, 2005, so about seven years. I still have home buyer's remorse from time to time. Every time the mortgage statement comes, <laughs> why did we do this? Home buyer's remorse. Typically, people will go into a, and I remember the very first house that Cheryl and I ever bought. I remember signing the papers, and I had this sick feeling in my gut. What am I doing? Are you sure we should? And Cheryl was right there saying, yes, it's fine. It's going to be good. It's going to be fine. Yeah, it's going to be okay. And she was encouraging that decision, God's predestination of your of your conformity follows your decision. You make the decision, but when you waver, God's right there to go, no, no, I've already predestined you to be conformed to the image of my son. I'm, I'm a little wavery here, Lord. I got you. I've predestined you to be conformed. Amazing. Wonderful. That's the idea. The predestination of God comes to a person who has made the choice that God knew he or she was going to make, and it shores up our confidence, it strengthens our resolve, it bolsters your decision to follow after Jesus. And Jesus, who came down from heaven and returned there, makes the word of God now more powerful and more personal. And what's the result of all of this? The result is what I would call myrtles for nettles. Myrtles for nettles. Look at verse 12. 
For you will go out with joy. You'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Now, some have read that passage and suggested that this is a metaphorical reference to the returning Jews coming back from Babylon into the land. It's metaphorical for the exiles. Well, it can't be. It cannot be applied that way. Two reasons why. This is a universal invitation to all people. It's not just talking about Israel. And secondly, God says the sign is everlasting and will not be cut off. So this is something far bigger than the return of the exiles. This is number three, final one in our notes, the glorious destiny. We stand before the great divide. God brings a grand delivery of his invitation across that great divide through Jesus' son. He waters us. He begins to cause the bearing and the sprouting. And then he tells us, there's more. Oh, there's more. There is a glorious destiny for you. For all and everyone who accept the invitation of Jesus, the glorious destiny we love to talk about is the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that's what's being described here. Rick, you talk about the coming kingdom a lot. You know what? Isaiah talks about the coming kingdom a lot. God's word talks about the coming kingdom a lot. And you can't get away from it. Why? Because God wants you to be looking for it. God says to you who are believers, be excited. My kingdom is right around the corner. And you're going to be part of that. God says to those who are waffling or who don't believe or who are unsure about this whole Jesus thing, listen, there's a great kingdom coming. And it's not a vague, ethereal thing. It is a kingdom where Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years before ever taking us to the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And even that's well described for us. The glorious destiny. In that time of unparalleled peace and joy. I love this. The mountains and the hills will give a shout out. Jesus, Jesus. I don't know how it's going to go. The trees will break into wild applause. I look at that and I go, that's, that's like, that's unnatural, man. No, it's supernatural, man. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 98, verse 7, Let the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord. For He's coming to judge the earth. And He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. That is, fairness. Or, not fairness. I don't know where that word came from. With fairness. He will judge the world with fairness. Rick, you really think that's a literal thing, the clapping trees and cheering mountains? Well, I know things will be wildly and wonderfully different than they are right now. I know that there's, fact, there's something amazing. The, the glorious destiny that we're talking about is not bound to the United Nations Global Earth Initiatives. It is not in the hands of the environmentalist. It is bound to something much bigger. And if you're an environmentalist, hold on to your Birkenstocks. You've got to hear this. It is. It is the future revelation of the sons of God. What is? The change in the earth. The earth becoming greener than it's ever been. The earth becoming environmentally reestablished in Eden-like proportions is bound to, is tied to, the revelation of the sons of God. What? Romans 8, 19, the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And that is just marvelous. It means man is not going to save the earth. God is when he reveals those who are saved. And the earth will be changed. No wonder the trees are clapping and the mountains are shouting and the sea is roaring. No wonder finally creation is free from the sin that corrupted it in the first place. The sin of man that corrupts this world. You know know why these... The global warming initiatives will never work? Because there will always be countries who reject it. 
There always will. There will always be those, or, or those who sign off on it and then continue to pump soot into the ocean and, and do, you know, environmentally dangerous things. Is it? Because we're sinners. We're sin people in this world. And we burn and we destroy and we trash and we litter. Well, I've done it myself. <laughs> Not a time for confession yet. But listen, as God wipes out the corruption of sin, the natural result of the original curse in the Garden of Eden, which is thorns and thistles, that will stop growing. What's going to grow instead? Myrtles, cypress, the beautiful plants, the ones that we all work so hard to keep growing in gardens, and you know, as opposed to the thistles that come up so easily. There's a great picture for us. Victor Buchsfazen writes, Human thorns and briars, unsightly and useless, fit only for the fire, are transformed and regenerated by the grace of God through His living Word. We are turned into tall, beautiful, useful, and majestic cypress trees. We are turned into fragrant myrtle trees which refresh and bless all those who come near them. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying creation will be changed and that will be a marvelous thing. But even better than that is the human life that was once thorny and thistly now becoming beautiful and useful and fruitful and bearing for the Father. The human life, gang, regenerated human lives are the living proof of the transformative power of the Word of God. Amen. And that's what Isaiah is telling us. That's what the Lord is proclaiming. I'm going to pour my Word into your life and it's going to change you. It'll transform you. Amen. Not into something you don't want to be. His Word will make you what you were created to be. The most free, wonderful, glorious, joyful place you could possibly imagine. Why does God do all of this? One reason and one reason alone. Verse 13 tells us it will be a memorial to the Lord. What are you saying, Rick? Simply that it is our glorious destiny to glorify the name of God. That word memorial there, it's name. It will be a name to the Lord. We'll look around in that coming kingdom. We'll see each other changed in glorious state. We'll see the world changed and we will all, we won't look at each other. I won't go to Steve and go, wow, you really did get conformed. We were all shocked. <laughs> no. Steve and I will look at each other and go, ah, praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. The invitations are out. A grand delivery across a great divide for a glorious destiny. And the king simply awaits your response. He just says, will you come? Will you come and receive my invitation? That's what I've got for you. I've done everything the feast has prepared. I've even prepared for you the wedding clothes. The Bible tells us it's fine linen, white and clean, the righteous acts of the saints. I've already got that ready for you to wear. Will you come? Will you simply accept the invitation?